Amen. Please go ahead and be seated. Some of you were uh, thinking that they were going to keep standing because I'm going to come up and lead songs. <laughs> that will never happen because we will clear the room very quickly if that were to happen. I just want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you, to the Ottawa Church of Christ. We here believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we celebrate this season with much joy. And I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. The title of my message is, What Child Is This? And so one of the things that I have shared about since we've been here, it's been seven weeks now, we are very, very excited. Uh, I didn't think it got this cold here, but that's another discussion for another time. But uh, we were very, very excited about being here. But we are a, a church that is going to be a church that really thinks about their relationship with God. It's not uh, while we need to j worship with great emotion, but also we worship with our great minds. And though this, this message, I it's uh, food for thought. I want you to think about some things as we talk about what child is this. I want to do a couple pieces of house cleaning, so to speak, so that we understand what's happening with us over the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday, we will be worshiping not here, not as a congregation, but we'll be worshiping in our family groups, and your family group leader is going to talk to you about that. And so if you're visiting with us, you're not a member of the congregation, and uh, uh, you don't have a weekly newsletter as to what's going on. If you come here, you can come here. You'll just be very lonely. Um, and so I want to encourage you. So we'll be back here on January the 6th. I, I believe that's, an, that's two weeks from today. And so we'll be back here worshiping the Lord with much fervor and much excitement. And I'll tell you what the title of the lesson will be. Planted or buried, okay? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, some intrigue for you, and as, we, uh, as we're gonna talk about the future and uh, what, what excitement we come with here in the Ottawa Church, amen? Uh, also, um, and so for, you know, uh, for us who are members of the congregation and participate in a weekly giving uh, of our contribution, uh, if we go ahead and wait till January 6th and then give uh, twice for that week, um, then that would be great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, you know, Christmas, as Dave mentioned in, when he was uh, leading some songs, it can be a time where there's so much hustle and bustle. This is a time that a lot of people celebrate with different thoughts. One of it, I've heard it said that Christmas is family. I mean, I'm all for family. But as disciples of Jesus Christ, Christmas is not family. And we'll talk about that. It's about the birth of Christ. And I know the history and the origin of Christmas is much debated even amongst Christian circles. But what we have used it for and what we are using it for, it's an awesome opportunity to stand in a pedestal and talk about the Savior of the world and to talk about his entrance into this world and to talk about the salvation that he brings, to talk about the hope that awaits us, and to talk about why is it so much hope in a world that is so challenging. Also, it's a time when many, many families, it's a modern-day guilt offering, where we exchange gifts for things we ought to do, and we think that this gift would somehow appease our spouse, our children, our parents for what we have not done during the year. That's not why, why we celebrate Christmas, and certainly it's not why we give gifts. Certainly we who understand what Christmas is all about, and that's celebrating 
the birth of Jesus Christ, that's not what it's all about. And God forbid that we who understand the salvation that Christ brings, that we somehow have put on our spouse and our children or our parents guilt of what kind of gift they ought to bring to us. And somehow, somewhere in our thinking that we make somebody feel guilty. By the way, if we demand a gift, it's no longer a gift. It's called blackmail or some other form of thing. But it's not a gift. Gift is someone that someone gives you. It's not an expectation of what you receive. That's a whole different thing altogether. And I pray that we as disciples never do that to our spouses, our children, our parents. That make them feel less than because they give you something that you think you deserve. That's not why we celebrate Christmas. Why I'm all for giving gifts and appreciation of one another. But that's not what it's all about. It really isn't. What child is this? In Isaiah chapter 9, we'll see a little bit about the, this child who was prophesied about and what ultimately will become of him. It says in verse 1, this is a time in Israel's history when there was not much good news at all. There were an oppression. It was not a time of spiritual revival. It was not a time in Israel's history when there was much light going on in their lives. And there comes a prophecy right now that is going to shine a light, literally and figuratively, on what is going to be the future of these people. And it says, nevertheless, in verse 1, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. As warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and holding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is good news anytime. It's better news when it's a time even of darkness. What child is this? This is the child that was prophesied about that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. That once we who walk in darkness will no longer be walking in darkness, but rather that the light will shine. And this is not only speaking figuratively, it's also speaking spiritually. You know, I, I got together with a young man earlier this week and we were studying the Bible. And we were talking about how Jesus is indeed the light of this world. 
And I tried to explain to him, and we actually were sitting in a place and that was well lit. And I said, can you imagine if we were to turn off the light in this room? Will the chairs and tables disappear? No. But when the light shines, it gives us a path in which we can walk our lives. That's what following Christ indeed is like. And that's what God, living in this world that is depraved. I'm not so sure. I think we always like, depends who you are, love to talk about how the world is worse than it's ever been. I don't know about that. How, by what measure? We all can pull out things. It's just, it's just lost. It's very lost. And we don't have to confirm to these patterns that indeed that we don't have to follow like blind sheep, but rather we can walk in this world of darkness because the light shines. The Bible describes itself as a lamp unto our feet. That it sheds light and it's to where we can walk. That we don't have to partake in the guilt offering that is oftentimes what's going on here. And somehow, somewhere, people's jeweler tells us that our wife or our spouse is going to be so happy if we were to spend $5,000. Or that Mercedes, the red one, is what our spouse really wants. Or the GMC envoy, whatever it is. And there's this picture that is somehow created that some of us buy into. And we fantasize that somehow that this is what's going to bring joy. Oh, it may bring momentary joy. I'm not talking about the fact that that doesn't. But that's not bringing well what the Bible describes as ultimate inner joy and the Bible says that's what, that's what this child is going to bring about let me ask you a question does this Christ this child when you think about him how does he affect your life how does he affect the way that you are going to act. This child says he's going to have a kingdom that is going to last forever. That is a concept that is simply difficult to grasp. We human minds only think of things in a finite term. Like when the Leafs is going to win the cup in June, for example. I knew Howard would say something. I, uh, we know that, you know. Uh, of course, I'm kidding. Not about the least winning. Amen to that. But we know we think in such a finite term. And yet the Bible says God is going to have a kingdom that is filled with joy of which there is no end. The book of Revelation tells us there will be no more weeping. No more crying. No more mourning. There are no need for lawyers, and we love lawyers. No need for doctors, and we love doctors. Or policemen, or an army. You think about this. The concept of that is unimaginable. Yet that's the kingdom that awaits us. The Bible tells us that God himself will sit on the throne, and we will worship him forever. That we are not going to depend on what the government is going to be doing in regard to our taxes or to our streets or to our pay. That that's not going to be our dependency. But indeed we're going to have a kingdom that is going to last forever. I tell you, I look forward to the future. Not because of what it holds, but because of who holds it. 
I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. But I know who holds the future, at least my future. Not because of I'm this great person, but because I've entrusted myself to this child that, was, that we celebrate his birth today. And so as we think about who's, what child is this, let's think about the great news, what his birth meant for all of us. You know, there are some atrocities that I cannot figure out. It is mind-boggling. I've had a chance in my lifetime to, to do some traveling. I've been to Africa, and I've seen AIDS camps, literally, where there are thousands of people. And the destiny that awaits them is death. I've been to the Philippines, to the Smoky Mountains, and literally 100 feet high is a garbage pail. And literally people, children will go there to pick garbage for their day's meal. Oftentimes, and I mean oftentimes, the children as they climb the mountain, they will fall in the middle never to be found again. And no one goes looking for them. I don't understand that. I can't explain it. When I think and then see that world through those eyes, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thought. And we can live in a life of depression. Yet when we think about who our God is and what he does, and I know that God cares. I know that. Because he did not even spare his own son. I mean, if ever I could stop something is the death of my son, I will stop it. Or the death of my daughter, I will stop it. And yet God had to fulfill what he needed to fulfill in the death of his son. But instead of me looking in the future without a God, I'd rather look at the future with a God whose promise is filled with hope and with joy and a solution to it all. And I don't know how it's all going to figure out. I know I have a role, and I want to play that role as much as possible. But I would much rather look to this God who has the future in his hold, the God that is filled with power, that is filled with mercy, that's filled with compassion, that's filled with all of these things. And so I'm not oblivious to the challenges that are out there. And then I walk the streets of the Magnificent Mile in Chicago, the supposed most expensive real estate in the world, and I see someone will buy a coat for $15,000, and I don't get it. I don't get it. And yet I choose as I think about what child is this, that he has provided a plan and a hope for all of us, that I would rather put my hands in this God that ultimately, ultimately will win in the end. And so I look forward with much hope, as I do with the Ottawa Church. You know, many people have asked me, so Tony, how has it been being here a few weeks? Are you regretful about coming here? Not an iota. As a matter of fact, I am much more thrilled today than when I came seven weeks ago because I have better shoes. No, 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 sorry. Uh, uh, because I have met with so many of you and, and there's just this connection that we're having 
and the hope that is in your eyes and that is in your heart that is so, so thrilling. But I think the, vic the, the, the future of the Ottawa church is that, that positive and exciting about what God is going to do. Luke, in Luke chapter 2, in Luke chapter 2, we read about this child again. This child that was prophesied about, this child that was born. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start in verse 1. Sorry, chapter chapter 1. I meant sorry, chapter 1. We read about in verse 26, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. What an introduction. Mary was greatly troubled. That shows her humility. It's sort of like, you're talking about me? And wonder what kind of greeting this might be. Some of us probably would respond, and I'm ashamed to say maybe I'm one of those that would say, well, finally you noticed. <laughs> I'm glad finally somebody revealed this to you, how great I am. And Mary says, are you talking to me? Are you sure you got the right person? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over Jacob's, Jacob's defendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit would come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What an encounter. A promise. Through her, the Son of God will be birthed. Can you imagine this, this woman, we'll talk about this another time, but when the purification rites came for Mary and Joseph, for Jesus, they did not have money to do the normal, typical purification rites. And so instead, they needed to use doves because they were so poor. I am so glad that God chose to bring the Son of God to the world through some poor people. Not because rich people are inherently bad, but because it tells us, you know what? There doesn't have to be a status in society in order for you to be used by God. There's not a bank account threshold that must be met. There's not an amount of jewelry that must be achieved. There's not an amount of letters behind your name in an education manner in which you ought to be used. And nothing inherently uh, uh, evil in those things. But God is saying, listen, I will choose the poor to shame the rich. I will sh choose the uneducated 
to shame the educated. And he helped us to understand that there's a big difference between being wealthy and being rich. I am far from being wealthy. I am incredibly rich. He's helped us to understand that there is a significant difference between having knowledge and being wise. He helps us to understand truly that there is a big difference between sex and love. And to differentiate those things. And he brought through his humble servant Mary, the Son of God. We pick it up in chapter 2. We know, of course, that Joseph was, I am sure, surprised when his wife, with whom he's never had any sexual relations, is telling him, I'm going to have a child. Can you imagine that conversation? And Mary says, I'm telling you, I've never had any sexual relations with anyone. And he's saying, what? I don't know. Did God appear also to, uh, with an angel to Joseph? The Bible never says that. I know for me, I have to have some form of support. And yet, this man chose to embrace his wife. And it says in verse 4, So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. We, we go to verse 6, verse 8 rather. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, watching over their flocks at night. We sing about that, don't we? An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Do you see the, the recurring theme here? The good news being brought? Great joy? They go together. A Christian who is not joyful is an oxymoron. It's not possible. Someone who truly understands. No, I'm not talking about not being happy. There are some times when there's some happenstance in our life that we are not happy about some things, okay? I understand that. But in terms of deep joy, happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on the Lord. And he says, listen, there is great joy. And I know atrocities happen. Sickness happens. Death happens. And those things can bring us sadness. Sure. But I'm not talking about that kind of sadness. I'm talking about not having joy. We can be sad and still be joyful. Think about it. You think about it. He says, he continues, he says, the angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And so we read, so not only is this baby who is going to be born, he is going to be the Messiah. And of course, we know that to be Savior. Messiah is a title. It's not his name. Jesus is his name. Christ is a title. So is Messiah. It's a title. It means Savior. And so we understand here that this is a prophecy about this Jesus who will be the Messiah. It says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, 
peace to those on whom his favors rest. And so I want you to picture what child is this, okay? In Bethlehem, there's craziness happening in a field. In heaven, everybody's now looking and there's a ruffling. There is a, there is a noise. There is, a, there is an energy. There is something great that is happening. It's why we celebrate Christmas. Oh, I know what the world does. They think it's the greatest time to make money. I know that. I'm not oblivious to that. I'm not stupid. I know that's what they use it for. But why can't we use it as well to proclaim the good news about this message? Amen. And people say, wait a minute, you didn't get a car and you got a candle and you were happy and I got a four-cylinder car and I'm not happy? What? What's the, what gives here? Man, but it was a really nicely scented candle. <laughs> The idea is that we, you know, like the Bible says how we gr do not grieve like the world does when someone dies. Similarly, we do not celebrate as the world celebrates the birth of Christ. And so we're going to beat them at their own game. I know what you want it to be, but I'm going to tell you what we're going to use it for. We appreciate the city of Ottawa building this building for us. They spent a lot of money. We pay a few hundred bucks. I right, thank you. We're going to be leaving here sometime soon, but we'll, that's another discussion for another time. We got no more chairs. That's a good thing. But we've got to understand this. We celebrate differently. What child is this? It brings about a celebration that is so different than the world. Like we don't grieve as the world does, we do not celebrate like the world celebrates. What is meaningful to us is different and more meaningful. And so the angels were ruffled and they're, they're, you know, they see this day and you know what they start doing? Singing. By the way, that's why I think, I'm not so sure it was such a silent night. And also, I'm not so sure that it was we three kings. The Bible never says there were three of them. There were just three gifts, but it never said there were three of them. Anyways, uh, I mean, war's not going to end. But because we know better, that doesn't mean that we, because we partake in those songs necessarily, that we're saying that is absolutely so. We understand poetry. It's not meant to be literal. But we... Do not succumb and get squeezed out by the world and its thoughts in that sense. We continue. We read about this Jesus and the news that who he is. Simeon, of course, this was his response in verse 28, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, actually, let's start in verse 27. It says, moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts when the, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to, who, to do work. Uh, sorry. When the parents brought in the child Jesus, brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Can you imagine? So here we are. What child is this? This guy said, now I could die and leave this earth now that I've seen this day. That was his response. I'm good. I'm ready to go. That's what we celebrate. 
Not cooking turkey. Oh, well, hey, I'm not, nothing against turkey. And so we who have been called out, we who are treasured disciples of Jesus Christ, we celebrate this child differently because we do it with an understanding of his mind. And we know, of course, as we take the Lord's Supper, that this Christ, the Messiah, as he was foretold about, that he ultimately came and he died for our sins. And this Christmas season is a time that we give honor and praise to this Messiah. And we say, I now know, in spite of the fact that I am a sinner, in spite of the fact that at times I shook my fist at God, at times that I stiff-armed him, at times when I knowingly rebelled against him, he has still offered salvation to us. And that which he calls sin is only there to destroy us. That God is, no, is not so selfish that he just wants us to honor him and give glory to him because he has some ego to fulfill. No, he calls sin sin because it destroys us. It eats away at us. There's no redeeming quality about it. What child is this? Is the child that has offered salvation to you and I. A child in which the heavens sing about him. The angels. I mean, I want you to think about that. I remember when I was dating my wife. Whenever love songs would come on the radio, I would turn it all up and sing. Air Supply became my favorite group. And so I'm singing songs, and I'm just thinking about her, how much I love her, how much I cherish her. I sing about her. I can't imagine that the most angelic beings in heaven now are singing about this Christ. How much honor and praise is due him. What does this child mean to you? Is it the time that you're going to get your watch, your iPhone, your TV, your car, your ring, your necklace, your sweater, your suit? Or is it, wow, this is good news that the Messiah has come and salvation has come to this world. What child is this? What child is this is the answer that you have to give? This child, because of Christianity, so much art, culture, have been done because of this Christ. There's no person. I'm not talking about the, I'm not talking about deity here for a second. I'm just talking about the man Christ Jesus for a second, okay? No one person has had impact on this world more than this man Christ Jesus. Not to mention the supreme being, the deity that he is. Because of Christ, and because of his teachings, women and children who used to be used as a nuisance to society has now have been elevated to the point. We still got to work on it, but to the point where it needs to be. 
arts and culture and song and charity, all done in the name of Christ. No other person has had the impact. You should read it sometime. You should read upon it what Christianity and what Christ has had the impact on this world. How this world has been preserved and kept alive because of the teachings and sayings of Christ and his followers. You know, when the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth, you know what is salt used for? For preserving things. This earth has been preserved simply because of the teachings of Christ and the impact that it's had on all over the world. What child is this? It's had an impact not only in our, our lives, but in the world at large. No wonder it says, in all the nations, joy will be felt. Not only because you're a redeemed person, but simply the nature of the world has changed because of who he is. What child is this? He's changed the entire complexity of the earth. When worlds used to say, hey, that is a problem, the slavery and the children and the women being killed and being used as property, that's, a pro that's just not our problem. Christian says, no, it is our problem. What child is this? He's preserved the earth. That's the Christ we worship. That's the Christ we sing about. That's whose birthday we celebrate. And so as we take the Lord's Supper, and we think about the fact that he's also the Messiah, let's give thanks to our God. Let us pray. God, we're so grateful this morning that your son came to this earth and that he became the unblemished sacrifice for our sins. God, I am humbled by the fact that I do not deserve any of the gifts that he has given us. And yet, because of your nature and because of who you are, you have chosen to have a relationship with us. As we take the bread and the wine this morning that is emblematic of your body and the blood, help us to be grateful and mindful of whose child and what child this is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.